Today, we're cracking open the fascinating world of quantitative trading. Specifically, we're exploring a pretty sophisticated approach to predicting market movements using machine learning. We've got some really compelling source material for you that dives deep into an old market concept, mean reversion. Our mission today is to unpack the theory behind this machine learning strategy, delves into its intricate details, examine its impressive results, though, maybe sometimes challenging results, and crucially, discuss the potential downsides. You know, there's that famous Pablo Picasso quote, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Our source material kind of uses this idea as its core inspiration, compares it to an expert chef's cookbook, you know, general instructions that only a real master can bring to life. Right. And what's fascinating here is how the author applies this philosophy to financial markets. They suggest that while, yeah, simple rules are often effective, sometimes breaking them with more sophisticated techniques, like machine learning, can yield surprising results. But this raises a really important question, doesn't it? Can a complex ML model truly outperform simpler trading rules, or does all that added complexity just introduce new challenges? Let's explore that tension. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, so let's unpack this idea then. Using machine learning for mean reversion. We're all sort of familiar with mean reversion strategies, that basic concept that prices tend to you know, gravitate back towards their average over time. But what's the core problem this specific machine learning model is trying to solve? What's the theory behind it? Well, traditionally, a lot of mean reversion systems just buy every single time an entry signal is triggered. Pretty simple. For instance, our source mentions a previous system. It would buy 100% of the time when a stock's QPI, that's the quantitativo probability indicator, basically a measure of how stretched a stock is, how oversold fell below 15. The core theory here is to move beyond that, well, that binary buy or don't buy decision. Yeah. It's a bit simplistic, right? Instead, this approach trains a machine learning model to actually predict the probability of a stock bouncing back once it deviates too far from its mean. So this transforms the whole problem into what's known in ML as a binary classification problem, essentially predicting will it bounce one or will it not a zero. Right, a probability instead of just a yes-no. And this is where the author takes that deliberate turn, sort of advocating for this rule-breaking approach over just keeping things simple. What specific algorithm did they choose to, well, to chase this more sophisticated prediction. They went with XG boost. That stands for extreme gradient boosting. And gradient boosting as a technique, it really comes into its own here. It's powerful because it builds models sequentially. You can kind of think of it like a series of specialists, each one learning from the mistakes of the one before it. Each new model focuses on correcting the errors made by the previous ones. It combines lots of weak models, usually decision trees, to create a much stronger, more accurate overall model, and XGBoost specifically. It's really popular in competitive machine learning. It's known for performance, speed, versatility. Mm -hmm. Makes it a go-to tool for these kinds of complex prediction tasks. Okay, so we've got the theory, use XGBoost to predict the probability of a bounce back. But how did they actually build this thing? What kind of data went into it? What features was it learning from? That's the nitty gritty, right? Exactly. The process involved basically three key steps. First, the data set and features. They use Norgate data, which is importantly survivorship bias free. And they focus on the whole Russell 3000 universe, current and past members. For the features, the model took in a whole bunch of indicators, things like rates of change, RSIs, QPIs across different time windows, you know, short, medium, long term, up to a year back. Other inputs included things like IBS internal bar strength, which looks at where the close is within the day's range. Also, normalized ATR for volatility, the distance to the 200-day moving average, turnover, even the Hearst exponent, which tries to gauge if something is trending or mean reverting. Pre-processing is absolutely crucial. Raw data is often messy, not directly usable for a model like this. So for features like turnover, for example, the author calculated his relative value both over time, like a time series, and also against all other stocks each day, which is called cross-sectional. For some other features, only the cross-sectional relative value made sense. And if you didn't need any pre-processing, standardization was also key applied to those cross-sectional features. So they're all 
on a comparable scale, you know. And the target for the model, what it's trying to predict, was defined pretty simply. One, if the stock bounced back within five days, meaning a positive return, and is zero otherwise if it had a further negative return. This whole process resulted in, well, a massive data set. It started with over 17 million data points back to 1998. Then it got filtered down quite a bit. They excluded penny stocks, only look at cases where the QPI was below 15, and ended up with a training matrix of about 1.2 million rows and 17 columns. So 1.2 million examples, each with 16 features plus that target variable. Okay, 1.2 million rows. That's some serious data. And how was this powerful XG boost model actually, you know, trained on all that data to learn the patterns? They used a sliding window technique for training. The model was retrained at the start of every single year, and it used a 15-year look-back period of historical data. So, for example, the model running in 2014, it was trained on data from 1999 right up to 2013. And following that logic, the model for, say, 2024 would have been trained on data from 2009 to 2023. This continuous retraining is really important. It lets the model adapt to changing market conditions, helps it stay relevant, rather than relying on a static model trained on potentially old, stale data. Right, so it keeps learning. Okay, so that's the blueprint. Meticulously prepared data, powerful algorithm, dynamic training, the stage is set. But mm. did all the sophistication actually deliver the edge they were looking for? Did it really beat the simpler rules? Well, initially, the results were somewhat disappointing, actually. When the model just bought everything where it predicted a bounce back probability over 50% and held for five days, mm -hmm. sure, it showed a positive expected return plus 0.7% per trade and a 54% win ratio. However, when they compared that to the simple rule, just buying when the QPI fell below 15, the p-value was 0 0.062. And that's above the usual 0 0.05 threshold people look for, for statistical significance. Oh, okay. So not statistically significant. Exactly. It means the difference they saw between the ML approach and the simple rule. Well, it wasn't strong enough to rule out random chance. There was still a, you know, a 6.2% probability that the difference was just luck. So as it stood initially, the complex model didn't offer a clear, provable advantage over the simpler method. Huh. So the initial results were, yeah, a bit underwhelming then. Does this mean that, you know, for all this complexity, this machine learning model was basically no better than the simple rules? Or was mm -hmm. there a way to tweak it, to refine it that actually unlocked its potential? That's a really crucial point, right? refining the strategy. The author didn't just give up. Instead, they tried tweaking that probability threshold. Instead of just acting on a 50% certainty, they looked for higher probabilities, specifically 60%. So only acting when the model was more certain about a potential bounce. Being more selective. Exactly. Being more selective. And the results then, they were indeed significant. The expected return per trade jumped up to plus 1.6%. The win ratio nudged up to 56%. And the payoff ratio also improved, meaning winning trades made more relative to what losing trades lost. And crucially, the p-value for this refined strategy, it dropped well below 0 0.05, uh, okay. which indicates a statistically significant edge over the simple rules. And that's paramount for any quant strategy. It means the difference wasn't just random luck anymore. It looked like a genuine repeatable advantage. The main trade-off, though, as you'd expect, was fewer trading opportunities. Went from over 450,000 signals down to about 94,000. That's a really powerful insight, isn't it? Sometimes being more selective is the key. It wasn't just about building a smarter model. It was about learning when to trust it most. That turned a maybe edge into a statistically significant one. So how was this refined strategy actually put into practice, like in a trading system day to day? Yeah, the implementation was designed to be quite practical. At the open of each trading day, the capital would be notionally split into 10 slots, 10 potential positions. The system would look to buy stocks where, okay, the three-day QPI from the previous close was below 15 AND. The ML model gave a bounce-back probability above that 60% threshold. Interestingly, there was no separate regime filter, you know, something to say, don't trade in bad market. Because the model already included the distance to the 200-day moving average as a feature, it kind of learned to filter out unfavorable conditions internally, which is quite neat. And if more than 10 stocks met the criteria on any given day, they were sorted by that predicted probability, prioritizing the ones the model felt strongest about. Max 10 positions held at once. And for risk management and liquidity, penny stocks under $1 were out. Plus, the capital allocated to any single trade couldn't be more than 5% of that stock's median average daily volume over the last three months. Mm -hmm. So try not to impact the price too much. Okay, that sounds pretty well thought out. Sophisticated theory careful implementation, and finally, a clear statistically significant edge when the model is more certain. So 
How did this refined strategy actually perform over time? What were the headline results from the back tests? Right. Let's look at the experiments. They started with a baseline, trading only S&P 500 stocks. Mm -hmm. And the results there, well, they weren't actually that great. Annual returns were only slightly better than just holding the S&P 500 index. And surprisingly, the maximum drawdown was higher. Sharp ratio, barely better. Mm, okay. Not amazing on the big caps then. No. But when the strategy traded the whole Russell 3000 universe, obviously applying those liquidity constraints, the results improved dramatically. Annual returns jumped past 30%. That's compared to about 11% for the S&P 500 benchmark over the same period. And the sharp ratio hit 0.92, which is quite respectable, versus 0.69 for the benchmark. Okay, over 30% annual return, that definitely sounds impressive. But as you often find in quant trading, that kind of impressive upside often comes with, let's say, its own challenges on the other side. What was the main drawback here, the catch with this otherwise strong performance? The big one, yeah, the significant downside, and this is always a crucial point for any trading strategy, was the maximum drawdown. It stood at a very high 55%. Compared that to the benchmark S&P 500's drawdown of around 34%. I mean, while all the years tested showed positive returns overall, experiencing a 50% plus drop in your capital, that would be, well far too much for most traders to actually sit through. It's one thing to see it on a back test chart, another thing entirely to live through it with real money. It really raises that fundamental question. How do you balance chasing those potential high returns with taking on such significant, potentially portfolio cratering risk? Absolutely, 55% drawdown. That's a huge psychological hurdle, never mind the financial impact. What steps did they take to try and you know improve that, to maybe limit the losses, bring that drawdown number down? They tested a combination of fairly standard risk management ideas, adding stop loss orders specifically set at 5% below the entry price for each trade, and also implementing a time limit. So if a trade hadn't hit its stop or presumably reached some profit target logic not fully detailed, it would just be exited after six days regardless. Time stop. Okay, stops and time limits. Did that help? It did improve things further, quite remarkably in some ways the annual return actually increased again to an impressive 45.6%. And the sharp ratio climbed significantly to 1.33, nearly double the S&P 500 benchmarks. The win rate dipped slightly to 60%, but the expected return per trade held steady. And importantly, the payoff ratio improved again from 0.73 to 0.86. That suggests the stops were cutting losses effectively. Okay, so even better returns, better risk-adjusted returns with the sharp ratio. But what about the drawdown? Was that finally reined in? Did these measures solve the big problem? Well, this raises that important point about persistent challenges, even with refinements. While the overall result improved, the maximum drawdown still remained quite high, right around 50%. Still 50%? Wow. Yeah. So even with stops and time limits, that potential for very deep drawdown didn't disappear. Looking at the monthly and annual returns, the strategy did have only positive years since 2014, which sounds great, and 64% of months were positive. However, it also experienced a worse single month of negative 14.5%. That was in February 2020 during the COVID-19 market crash. The author does note that if you sort of exclude that specific extreme event, the drawdowns were typically more like 20% or lower. But that highlights how much these strategies can be impacted by those outlier black swan type market events. The source also briefly touches on trading costs, just noting their impact, especially when you're trading a broader universe of potentially less liquid stocks. Those costs add up. Right. So it really underscores this tension, doesn't it, between the really impressive potential, the high returns, and these inherent market risks, these deep drawdowns that even sophisticated modeling and risk controls couldn't fully eliminate. So, okay, we've taken quite a deep dive into this machine learning based mean reversion strategy. We saw the fascinating theory using XG boost to predict bounce back probabilities, not just signals. We saw the meticulous details of building it, the massive data set, the feature engineering, and the real power that came from refining that probability threshold, being more selective to find that statistically significant edge. Mm -hmm. And we also observed those impressive annual returns, particularly when they added the stop losses and time limits, definitely eye-catching numbers. However, that persistent high maximum drawdown, even after all the improvements, is really a critical takeaway here, isn't it? It just goes to show that even with highly sophisticated machine learning, market volatility and those big unexpected outlier events can still pose significant and maybe unavoidable challenges. Absolutely. Which brings us to our final provocative thought for you, the listener. Given the impressive potential returns we saw with this strategy, but also that significant persistent drawdown risk, 
How do you think about weighing aggressive returns against substantial risk in your own pursuit of knowledge? What stands out to you from this deep dive about that balancing act between aiming high and managing the inherent challenges, whether it's in finance or really any complex field you might be exploring? 